decided to title the talk today, Emerging Treatment Options for Neurotrauma. And what I hope to convey in my talk today is the, the benefits of using biomaterials as this emerging treatment option, and how we at InVivo are progressing towards commercializing these world-class biomaterial medical devices to treat all stages of, of SCI. A little bit about myself. Um, as was mentioned, I, I joined in vivo quite recently back in April of this year from academia. My research focused in primarily on um, developing intelligent biomaterials for both drug delivery and tissue engineering applications. And one of the other reasons why I really wanted to attend this symposium is to try to understand what are the current successes going on in today's SCI research and what are the current challenges and limitations. I then want to go ahead and, and, and leverage my expertise in biomaterials and try to design smarter materials that can either provide enhanced benefits to those successes that are going on now or, or overcome the limitations that we are seeing with today's research. And again, at the end of the day, we still at InVivo are very focused on developing products through the FDA to able to treat uh, patients in, in various stages of spinal cord injury. So I don't want to spend too much time on the slide because the audience here is, is very well informed. But as was alluded to earlier, it's extremely important to understand the pathophysiology of the injury site at various stages um, throughout the injury. Because as we start to think about certain interventions, it's critical to know what's going on at the, um, the lesion site. And so, again, in, in acute early time points, it's an extremely hostile environment where there's a lot of uh, inflammation um, giving rise to enhanced cellular apoptosis and cellular necrosis. And then as later points, as we go to hours, days, weeks, we start to observe demyelination, this glial scar that we heard about earlier this morning uh, form, as well as axon degeneration, which combined together really impedes what we're trying to strive for, which is regeneration. And so, again, as we think about ways in which we can treat various stages of SCI, I wanna then talk about some of the current SCI treatment paradigms going on currently at each stage of the process that I described. Again, as I talked about, in the acute setting, it's a highly inflamed environment. So researchers and clinicians are looking at delivering anti-inflammatories to mitigate that, that response with hopes of trying to prevent the cellular apoptotic event, preserve tissue that's spared already at the site, giving rise to enhanced neuroprotection. And then as we transition more to the chronic setting, there's been some fantastic research that's gone on regarding cell therapy or delivery of growth factors or various enzymes to bridge, all with the, the, the motivation of bridging this glial scar that we heard about, um, trying to recapitulate a natural healing pathway at that injury site. We at InVivo truly feel that biomaterials themselves can provide um, very positive benefits to uh, spinal cord injury treatment or can act in synergy with the current mode of treatments both in the acute or in the chronic setting to provide synergistic effects. And so I want to take a step back. For, I mean, this may be trivial for some of you, but really talk about what a biomaterial is. Um, and again, that is where my background and expertise lies in. And what a biomaterial is, is literally how it sounds. It's a natural or synthetic material that is designed to be introduced into the living tissue, especially as part of a medical device. And some of the advantages of using these tissue, um, excuse me, these materials in vivo are that they're designed to A, B, biocompatible. Their various properties are highly, highly tunable and they can be engineered to meet a specific uh, product characteristic. I show a, a graph here of, of, of basically, let's make an analogy of a, um, you're baking and you have the same ingredients, but you add them in different ratios and you get a very different product. That's what we can do with our biomaterials. And that's what I show here is I can take the same ingredients, add them in different ratios, and I see varying mechanical properties. Some of them may be useful for some indications, others may be useful for other indications. And that's why we at InVivo are, are very engaged in, in open communication with our customers or our neurosurgeons to identify what material is most appropriate for what indication. Also, the, these materials can provide mechanical support, support and integration to the surrounding tissue, giving this neuroprotective effect. And going to that next level of complexity, they can act as intelligent cell or drug carriers. Again, we want to look at, can we deliver these therapeutics on a controlled time scale, days, weeks, months? Again, we can look at current treatment regimes that are being utilized now with other delivery systems and incorporate them within a biomaterial. And lastly, these materials are designed to be biodegradable. 
which is, which is an advantage, so you don't have to go in for a second surgical uh, procedure. Essentially here, as a biomaterials engineer, what we try to do is we try to, at early time points, have the biomaterial um, take on a, a lot of the mechanical support in, at an at injury site, and then as spared healthy tissue evolves, that biomaterial will be designed to degrade. So I just want to talk briefly about biomaterials are not a, a new material. It's not a new topic. In fact, you know, in 2008, it was a $26 billion market that was focused primarily in the orthopedic and the cardiovascular space. And there's some reports out that this uh, market is expected to triple in the next three years. Some of the products that are currently on the market and have proven to be extremely safe are screws, dural sealants for dural, uh, dura, dura seal for, as a dural sealant, as well as bioresorbable sutures or drug eluting stents. So we at Invivo are asking, why not translate these successes in the marketplace to approaches to treat spinal cord injury? And so some of the approaches that we hope to take at Invivo to treat spinal cord injury are shown here in, in certain diagrams where we look at, let's just take the biomaterial itself and let's let it act as a structural support. This will give it the neuroprotective effects to spare the healthy tissue that still remains after an injury. Let's go to the next level and let's incorporate or impregnate some therapeutics into this, this gel or biomaterial. Whether we put methylprednisolone in to provide neuroprotective and anti-inflammatory effects, or we use something such as NT3 to provide neuroprotective and regenerative effects. We have the ability to do that with this platform technology, we feel. And then again, like I've alluded to, there's been some fantastic work done in cell therapy. So why not try to encapsulate our cells or, or uh, within our biomaterial devices, give them a place to attach to, give them a place to adhere to. Let's try to pr um, promote the survival of these cells when they're introduced into this otherwise uh, hostile environment, allowing them to proliferate and, and do the function that they were designed to do. And again, we at Invivo are trying to take a multifaceted approach to strategically populate our pipeline with all of these different therapies to treat various um, stages of spinal cord injury from acute with our first product uh, that is currently at the FDA to chronic levels, uh, which is further in our pipeline. So for, for some of you, this may be, you know, you may be well aware of in vivo therapeutics, but I just want to give a little bit of a timeline or history to the company. Um, it was founded on the research in Bob Langer's lab at MIT, which again, he essentially invented the field of uh, controlled drug, drug delivery and tissue engineering using these polymeric scaffolds and polymeric devices. In the late 1990s, the, the concept of using this polymer-based stem cell approach to, to achieve neural repair was conceived. In 2005, the company was founded. And then between 2008 and 2011, a lot of fantastic work has been done to uh, broaden our, our patent portfolio as well as really um, obtain a lot of very strong preclinical data with our biomaterial devices. Um, highlighted in the, the, the couple of landmark non-human primate SCI studies that were conducted, um, which led to the company winning the 2011 David F. Apple Award. And then, as I alluded to earlier, in 2013, we uh, anticipate having our, our first product uh, enter the clinic um, to treat acute SCI. And I, one of the reasons why we truly feel that we are poised to lead this biomaterials development for spinal cord injury treatment is um, based on some of the work that's been done, obviously in the past 10 years, but more, more so more, more recently, the type of resources that have been given to us. Again, like I said, the, the technology was founded in, in the prolific MIT Langer Lab. Um, he has a lot of experience generating this translational research in the biomaterials field. And then back in July, um, we actually moved into our new corporate headquarters in Cambridge, Mass. And this headquarters is equipped with a 400 rodent uh, vivarium dedicated to spinal cord injury research, as well as a GMP manufacturing clean room, which allow us, allows us to make FDA compliant materials all under this one roof. Also, we've assembled a, uh, a very top-notch research and development team with 10 plus disciplines of science represented, ranging from mechanical engineers, biomedical engineers, chemical engineers such as myself, all the way out to stem cell biologists, uh, even neurosurgeons on our staff, which really helps us accelerate this product development process as we start to generate user needs and then go back to the benchtop to validate them. And lastly, we've assembled an experienced and diverse leadership team shown here, where a lot of the, pe a lot of the people on the slide here have had experience in developing and commercializing over hundreds 
of biomaterial devices that are currently on, uh, successful on the market today. So I did want to make a transition here and talk a little bit about some of the programs we have going on at InVivo um, regarding biomaterials. Um, the first one that you may or may not be aware of is our uh, polymeric scaffolding technology. And I show a digital image here of what this polymeric scaffold looks like. As you can see, it's highly porous, it's biodegradable, and it's made primarily of FDA-approved uh, polymers. And again, the hypothesis being here is this, if this inter intervention is, um, we can use this material as an, an acute intervention um, to spare uh, healthy tissue at the injury site. And now, again, I alluded to the uh, non-human primate studies um, that were done through 2008 to 2011. So I do want to go ahead and show some videos of some of the behavioral outcomes that we did see that were very encouraging and that we're very excited about. And so as you can see, uh, we have two primates. And again, the injury model here is a T9, T10 lateral hemisection. I will say we are currently looking at uh, contusion models in sight, which is more relevant to the human population. But as you could have seen right there is that we saw enhanced locomotor control with our scaffold only treated group. Now again, this is not treated with growth factors, cells, but again, that's something that we have envisioned in our pipeline. This is just scaffold only and we're seeing that behavioral outcome effect, which was extremely exciting for us. And this was at 12 weeks. If you look at just the, the monkey and the scaffold only treatment group, we then have some video that shows him on on an A-frame device. Again, on a treadmill, it may have been forced locomotion, but this, if you take note to it, look at the left paw digits and look at the control of them. It was very encouraging. This is the first time this video has been seen. So we were extremely encouraged when we saw, we saw this um, occurring in the scaffold treated only primate. And what we're doing right now is we're currently analyzing the EMG to try to quantitate this effect that we're seeing on a video that's extremely powerful. So I then want to start go, um, moving forward and talking about how we see this intervention uh, using this medical device. And unfortunately, this animation will not work, but I, I'll just go ahead and, and talk through it. Again, we're talking about intervening in an acute setting less than 10 days where a patient would come into the, the room and undergo a decompression laminectomy. The spinal column would be stabilized. This device that I showed a digital image of would then be customized to match the lesion site and implanted. I think one of the things that we're most excited about in some of our most our, our recent accomplishments over the last year has been our product development driven focus of how at the end of the day we have to de um, de deliver FDA approved materials. And so our whole approach, like I said, has been very customer driven, very surgeon driven. We've had open dialogue with them to identify what their needs are in, uh, for a treatment such as what we're proposing. And so here are some of the devices that we have. Um, we have four unique sizes. And again, this was all um, based on our discussions with, with the customers, ranging from six millimeters down to two millimeter diameter scaffolds. Now, they wouldn't exactly be in this type of packaging device, but that's another thing that we have to think about as we deliver our products to the FDA, or how are they being packaged? And so to the right, I show this, this, this packaging device called a hydration chamber. And essentially, what the surgeon would do is they would get this, this packaging device. They would hydrate the sample through those orifices. And the purpose of that is we're trying to, again, we're trying to spare the healthy tissue that's there. We want to make sure we're not inserting a rigid object into the lesion causing more damage. So we're trying to make the mechanical properties more compliant to match that of the spinal cord. So the surgeon would hydrate the sample for a predetermined amount of time and then customize it to match more, more accurately match the lesion size prior to implantation. And as I mentioned, uh, the first product we hope to enter the clinic in uh, 2013 to treat acute SCI. Now, I want to talk a little bit about another product that we have uh, in development currently, and that's our injectable hydrogel, which again, really is where my background comes from, is looking at these uh, hydrogel materials. And this animation doesn't work as well, but what I want to tell you is that essentially it's a less invasive way to introduce a biomaterial to provide these neuroprotective, neuroregenerative effects into the lesion site. A hydrogel is essentially um, something that starts as a solution, can be injected, and then it cures or becomes solid to match the exact lesion size, which is, as, is extremely heterogeneous. But this would, in fact, take on the shape of that lesion and cure, providing those neuroprotective effects. So as I lead the program in developing the hydrogel technology, 
there are a lot of questions that I need to think about and, con and consider to answer. How long do we want this material around? Do we want it to be around for days, weeks, months? We, again, we can tune that. That's one of the things that is very versatile about these biomaterials. What type of mechanical properties are we looking for? Do we want something more rigid, less rigid? What type of therapeutic release profile are we looking for? And, and a lot of these discussions come to great researchers around here that are identifying new molecules that are out there. What type of delivery regime are you, regimen are you using now? Are you giving it on a daily basis? Why do you need to do that? What type of therapeutic level are you trying to hit on a day-to-day -day basis? And we can try to achieve that release profile using a biomaterial with one injection. And how do you want the biomaterial to interact with its environment? Do you want it to be passive? And what I mean by passive is, a, is more bio-inert. Or do you want to be more active? Do you want it to be decorated with vi various biological cues to interact in, 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 with its surrounding tissue and integrate with the surrounding tissue? These are all things, that, again, we can do in a modular fashion with our, with our biomaterial platform. And I kind of describe that pictorially. Shown here is what we try to, are trying to accomplish in the coming months. We're trying to really understand the formulation space of this hydrogel technology. And I'll go back briefly to the analogy of kind of the baking. We have a lot of different ingredients we know that can go into this, and we just want to know what comes out of it. And what comes out of it could be useful for one, one condition or one indication, whereas what comes out of another couple of inputs could be useful for another one. So really it comes down to, again, talking to these surgeons, understanding what is the need to treat maybe an acute spinal cord injury, what about looking at a chronic setting with cells? And then maybe what about looking at a chronic setting with delivering growth factors or enzymes such as chondroitinase? And then once we get these responses back, we may find in, that they overlay right in these sections of our formulation space. And the goal here is to try to intelligently design these biomaterials and, and identify lead formulations out of this box to move forward to our preclinical st studies that, again, we have the ability to perform in-house in our, in our new global headquarters. And so and I have two more slides left, and I really want to make this an open discussion. So I wanted this presentation to be more educational, but I want to provide a little bit of a vision of how we're looking to, again, you know, populate the, the pipeline and really try to address the chronic population. We've heard a lot of great talks about a lot of new therapies that are being de developed, whether they're various growth factors delivery, they're peptides, they're chondroitinase, they're enzymes. They're still going to have to be delivered in a very intelligent fashion, and I feel like that's what biomaterials can bring to the, the, the treatment option. Um, I show here a biomaterial that's delivering two therapies. Maybe it's something that's delivering chondroitinase for a fast or, or in a rapid time frame, and then delivering NT3 to promote regeneration over some time course. Again, that's something that we can tune into our material. And then as we look at, again, all the great work being done with cell therapy, well, by encapsulating or incorporating these cells within to a material, not only can we keep them localized at the, the lesion site, which maybe you can reduce the number of cells that have to be implanted, but we also can probably keep them alive longer. We can decorate these, these materials with various biological epitopes, directing and controlling their fate, make, letting the, basically putting them in more of a physiological environment that they're used to being in, but they're protected by this biomaterial. And lastly, I just wanted to you know, talk about all the great work that is being done in the stem cell space, in the delivering of the enzyme, the delivering of these growth factors to promote regeneration. We at Invivo feel like biomaterials can be used in synergy to enhance the effects that's already seen with these treatment options. Also, I want to say I have drawn this, this slide quite accurately where I have them depicted essentially as, as silos. To really treat the chronic population, we, I truly believe that we can't keep acting like they're silos and they're individual treatment options. And I think at Invivo, we truly believe that biomaterials act as the bridge between these various treatment options. And it really becomes down to how do we want to deliver these, these materials, and when do we want to deliver them? And that's what I think uh, you know, we have a good handle on at Invivo. So again, I just wanted to make this an, uh, you know, an educational type talk, and I look forward to a discussion, so thank you. <laughs>